actually got to go to Honolulu, Hawaii, and I didn't because I had just taken a job here in Charlotte. So this is my way of giving the presentation and pretending I'm in Hawaii. There we go. So an assessment of turbulence models for a strut wing junction. Sounds like a lot of technical stuff, but since we have some non-technical people in the audience, I'll make sure that all questions are answered as quickly and efficiently as possible. I'm going to go over a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about tonight. First of all, background. Again, since it's a non-technical audience, I'm going to go over some of the more technical aspects of this in a brief manner. Then I'll discuss the objective of this research, followed by how this was set up, the results, and our conclusions. So first of all, the background. This is the modern airliner, and it hasn't changed in more than 50 years. Big long wings, a tube in the sky, engines hanging off, and a tail. That's about it. But as the introducer of my introducer said, people are still clamoring for lower and lower fares. So we have to keep increasing the efficiency of airliners. Now you can see you have a Boeing 707, first introduced I believe in 1956, an Airbus 300, a Russian aircraft, and finally the Boeing 787. The Boeing 787 is the most efficient airplane, but it still hasn't changed in its basic layout, its plan form design as it were. We want to change that. We want, we propose a truss brace wing design. It was first proposed by Finnegar in 1954. They call it the TW, TBW concept. And it has many benefits. The wings get longer, as you can see here, when you add these struts and trusses. They're longer and they're thinner which means that they have less weight and hopefully less drag as well. They have a long, larger aspect ratio and the bottom line is you can carry more cargo, hopefully, with less fuel. Now there are some difficulties, one of which is structural. If you were a passenger on one of these aircraft and you saw a big old truss holding up your wing, you might wonder, is it just going to kind of snap off there? which is a major concern. Studies at Virginia Tech have shown that the TBW is feasible, but one of the biggest issues is it called interference drag. And you might be asking yourself, as I did a long time ago, what is interference drag? Well, interference drag is when two aerodynamic bodies are in close proximity, and the total drag is greater than the sum of the drag of the two bodies in the system. So you might imagine two cars next to each other on the highway. You might be able to feel some aerodynamic benefit or no benefit from it. And accurately modeling this phenomenon is very complicated at airline cruise speeds. It's fairly straightforward to say what's going to be at 60 miles an hour, but at 600 miles an hour, there are some flow features that are known but are hard to quantify without actually testing them in real life. And so examples of this are on a concept like this with two engines and a strut, but you see these junctures, what's going on there? We need to find out. So I mentioned, I mentioned airliner cruise speeds, and one of the biggest problems with this is what's called shock-induced separation. When a body gets close to Mach 1, the speed of sound, it develops a shock wave. If that shock wave is strong enough, it actually induces something called separation. Separation is when the flow goes from, instead of maybe going from left to right in this instance, it starts going the other way. It tears off of the body. This produces a huge amount of drag. And we want to get rid of it. We don't like drag. We don't like paying those high airline prices. Get rid of the drag. The current turbulent models have really trouble, have a lot of trouble predicting this phenomenon in particular. So they need a good assessment. That is what our objective is. Our objective is to look at how computational models 
can be applied to this TBW concept. And there's been little previous research. And that which has been done shows that interference drag increases significantly in this region where there are two trusses or struts rather than any other region of the aircraft. The objective is to assess interference drag prediction at high, at, excuse me, at airline cruise speeds using RANS turbulence models. RANS turbulence models are specific to the industry. I'll take questions on that at the end of the presentation. So what was our setup? How are we going to go about assessing these models? Well, first, we're going to, or mainly we're going to compare those computational predictions to experimental data. The, the data was collected from the University of Texas at Arlington, UTA, in their transonic facility, which can be seen here. This was an airfoil fin at airline cruise conditions, and the angle of attack varied from zero to seven degrees. And you can imagine, it's a fin about the size of your hand. The idea is to get conditions that are about 600, 700 miles an hour, and then vary it slightly up and down, and use the data collected from that to see how well it corresponds to the computational data. So the computational setup. Before I go too far into this, I want everybody to close their eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Imagine a box, just a single little box. And imagine that there's air coming in from one of those walls, and that air is leaving from another one of those walls. And then in each of those walls, air is coming in and air is leaving. Now if you think really hard, you could probably figure out, just you, understanding just a little bit, how much air is going in and how much air is coming out of each one of those walls if you only had to worry about those six sides. All right, now open up your eyes. That's basically what we're doing here except we have millions of these little boxes. We're just calculating how much air is going in and how much air is going out of millions of boxes. That's our computational domain. That's our virtual wind tunnel, if you will. We use the software called ANSYS, which does the calculations. And our assumptions are the as-built geometry matches the design. This doesn't always happen. Those walls might be a little bit different because of heat constraints, or because maybe a builder was sloppy, that's a pretty big assumption. We also assume steady flow and solid walls. And finally, this is just for the geeks in the room, it's created, it's created using pointwise grid gen, and it has 44.4 4 million cells. System response quantities, these are basically what we're measuring so that we can, can compare the computational data and the experimental data on the same level playing field. We get four quantities, the distance from the leading edge from which the separation starts, the maximum distance, the distance at a specified cord length, that's distance from the leading edge. And we also just generally see how big this area is and some of those constraints. You can see here, this is what it would look like from the computational domain. These are streamlines on the surface, and you can see that big separation region coming up and then going back around, like a, a little vortex or something. And then this is, these are oil lines, which were taken in the tunnel. They put little drops of oil, and as the air goes over it, it spreads it out in a thin film. So you can see, well, it's hard to see down here, but in some instances, you'll actually be able to see that circulation right here. And that's how we can correspond the experimental and the computational data. So what did all this tell us? Well, what we found was in the computational domain, at angle of attack 3, there is a small amount of high-speed flow, Mach 1.3, which creates that separation bubble. And then at angle of attack 4, that region grows immensely. And near the wall, there's a lot of separation. In aerodynamics, this is called a corner point. It's where you change the conditions just a little bit and you get a vastly different response. 
Now, th then we took that, we put streamlines on it, and we compared that to the tunnel data at UTA. And what we found was, at angle of attack three, again, computation showed very little separation. And you can kind of see a little bit of separation on these dots, which is the information from the experimental facility. Down here at angle of attack four, there was virtually no change in experiment, whereas what we saw in the computational sphere changed a lot. So what can we conclude from this? Backing all of this out, we took a very simple experiment, a fin being varied up and down, and then we looked at that in an experiment, a physical experiment, and a computational experiment. And what we found was that the CFD, the computational experiment, overpredicts the separation in this region. And it is due to either the turbulence models that were used or the porous wall effects. It is more likely that it's the turbulence models, just to note, because, uh, because of other, studies, other limited studies that have been done in this region. That large separation in the interaction region, where that high speed flow was getting near the wall, leads to increased interference drag. The models in this study overpredict that interference drag, and this is at its worst. So basically, the studies that were done on the truss brace wings were using the worst case scenario. And even in that worst case scenario, they were shown to be effective. So the bottom line is, this study shows at least from this perspective, from a drag perspective, the truss brace wing is feasible. So when you guys come out here next time, airline